To find out about this, I went on to Google, like everybody else, to see what's there. And I went on to a site called Hyperphysics, which is in fact in the notes for this lecture. And I thought, well, let's just work on from what is currently available on the net, because that is not the summation of human knowledge, it's what somebody thinks they want you to know. And it was a bit interesting. We have the first slide, Paul. And um, this is just to explain the EM spectrum from very low. The peak-to-peak -peak measurement of the wave is several kilometres. That's very long wave. They affect you just as much. Everybody thinks it's the short waves that affect you. No, no, no. It does not seem to be like that. We get ultrasound is not very long at all, about 15 to 20,000 kilometers. Are we getting feedback? Radio is hundreds of meters, VHF tens of meters, UHF just meters. Microwave, we're getting down to centimeters, so many centimeters. Infrared is millimeters. By the time we get to visible light, it's nanometers, which is a meter with 10 to the ninth uh, power, negative. Ultraviolet above that, X and gamma rays apparently the same thing. And uh, the funny thing is that once the wavelength gets to an infinite size, it's the end of the system. It does have an end, uh, which we discovered. You remember I was saying about the elephants and the tortoise. You've got to go through to the end of the system to make sure you didn't miss something. Oh, we got to the end of the system. Low frequency, now it all depends on whether the physics people think you absorb this into your body or not. That appears to be the big thing they talk about. It's all wrong because all fields will intermingle, you know, they all interact with each other. Absorption is a separate issue. Low frequency, 50 to, from 16 hertz, which is I think a, a, a trained frequency, Low frequency to 50 hertz power cables, not mentioned on this site, not entirely safe, too hot to handle, don't want to talk about it, don't know, it just wasn't there. Uh, but then if you look on other sites, they say um, leukaemia has been linked by a lot of people, mainly desperate mothers. Desperate mothers know more than scientists, you know because they care so much for their children. They, they put two and two together and they get four. Scientists don't, they say we don't know. Because of course they want more funding, more car parks, more superannuation and more funding. This is how you explain universities. Um, and we go to ultrasound and it is admitted on this site that it wasn't entirely safe because it's absorbed deeply into the body tissue so if it's absorbed, it's bad for you. If it goes straight through your body, it's not. I don't understand that argument. Um, ultrasound, everybody has. So you can see the uterine contents to see what sort of bundle of joy you're going to get. Then they say interesting stuff like when you go and have ultrasound, it releases tiny bubbles into your blood, into the tissues and slight heating of the tissues. Did they tell you this at the doctor's surgery? No. So it's not entirely safe at all because there are strange things happening at cellular level. We go up to low frequency radio. Here the body is supposed to be non-absorptive. It goes straight through you. So if it's going straight through you, remember that most of your body is in fact space, so certain radiation will pass straight through presumably not matching to anything, it won't hit anything. Very high frequency radio, we've got FM radio, police radio, rescue services and fire services. Wasn't mentioned on this site because of course we couldn't have anyone saying there was something wrong with emergency services. Microwaves and radar, we're getting down to this long wavelength. Body is supposed to be transparent, and then they say in the same place that slight heating of the body occurs. How can it be heating the body if, it, if it's not being absorbed? Yeah, so I assume absorption is taking place. Infrared photons, some absorption takes place at shallow level of the shallow blood vessels. 
Now visible light, we go a little bit higher. We've got a tiny little band of visible light in the EM spectrum. This is strongly absorbed and causes electron transitions when light is absorbed by the electron. In other words, the energy value of the electron goes up. And then I suddenly remembered eating some fast food from one of those, the bain-marie, with, um, with lights over it. Have you ever had that? It's supposed to keep food hot and it stops the bugs from growing because there's so many photons. Well, of course, you have one bit of food from that and you immediately throw it back up again, which is what I did. I thought, funny. I remember these little experiences and I think, why did that happen? Five minutes later, the food comes back up. The energy value of that food had been increased greatly by over irradiation to light and, of course, heat in the Bain-Marie. Just throwing that at you is something to think about. Ultraviolet light, these last ones, ultraviolet X and gamma rays, are, are called ionizing. And then they say things like, it knocks the electron right out of its orbit. It's not in an orbit. <laughs> so <laughs> when reading the stuff on the net about f physics, you have to take, draw a deep breath because it omits a lot, it's self-contradictory and doesn't mean anything when you try to translate it back into our language, which is about the body field. Ultraviolet light is strongly absorbed and causes ionising effects, meaning it, it changes the structure of the way the atom is constructed a lot. You could imagine that's going to be quite bad for you. Um, so the large biological molecules are going to be bashed around a bit. And then they say it's known to cause skin cancer, cataracts, ageing and immune suppression. At last we found an admission that EM smog does something. Then it says that so much exposure per going up so many metres, it sort of increases 100% every, I've forgotten what it is now, and I thought, what happens when you're in an aircraft? You know how bad UV can be lying at the sun on the beach and you get like what happened to me the other day, a uh, severe sunburn next to Harry's pool. Imagine in an aircraft and then you go onto the net and try and find out about UV exposure in aircraft. Don't want to talk about it, but it's fabulously safe because they have some lead in the windows in the aircraft. And I'm thinking, oh my God. Great. So there is some screening in aircraft against gamma rays, but nobody wants to talk about it. Uh, this page cannot be displayed, is what we found. But there are huge exposures during air aircraft travel. People frequently report to me getting colds, flus, and feeling of exhaustion after flying. It's because your whole immune system has just been fried. It's the lymphatic system which is fried, which is one of the main antiviral activities in the body. So these mysterious colds and flu are a sign that you have electrosmog sensitivity. Now we go even higher to x-rays. These are not absorbed according to our hyper, hyper physics site. And it actually covers a huge range of frequencies. X-rays are not just X-rays. It goes on and on through quite a large area of the EM spectrum. So different X-rays will do different things, presumably. Um, it's supposed to uh, change the atomic structure, meaning it couldn't possibly be good for you. Um, the physics people say that X-rays cause the emission of electron-positron pairs. It doesn't actually get absorbed, it goes right through, but as it's going right through, it changes the qualities of the atomic structure in the molecules in your body. Not very nice. So the science isn't very clear, but the politics is that um, electrosmog is here to stay, and, uh, and it's here to stay because um, there are so many companies making money out of it. But the extraordinary thing was that the, the physicists started to talk about matching, whether or not they used the word matching. Does 
the radiation match to any structure, into any atomic structure inside the body. And I thought, that's amazing. We've got physicists talking about matching fields. And I thought, I don't feel like such an outcast anymore. They actually said it. And I thought, this is interesting. So then I thought, that's fine. Let's pick up what physics we've got there and say, well, how much does e-smog match to things in your body? It can only affect the body if it matches. Forget about absorption, non-absorption. It's not a good way of looking at it. Can we have another slide? This is what generates e-smog. Uh, TV screens, fluorescent lights. No one can spell fluorescent. Trains, buses, cars, 1S, telephones, blah, 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 they all are. Everybody always investigates e-smog as if it's a particular frequency that's the problem. And I'm trying to debunk that idea today and say, I think they're all fields. The fields have a habit of joining up. Into, that's why it's called e-smog. They all join together into some sort of big smoggy thing that makes you sick. Can we have another slide? How do you know that you're electrosensitive? Some people it doesn't affect, but uh, some it does. And uh, we found warmth in the face, tingling in the body, eye irritation, concentration and memory failure, feeling of flu that never develops, that links with chronic fatigue too, nausea and cardiac palpitations. Well, you can't really diagnose e-smog from that because it could be all sorts of things. And uh, it's not a differential diagnosis as far as I can tell. Is there any cure or treatment for electrosmog sensitivity? Well, I had it and I went to the doctor with chronic fatigue. And he said after I went to a diagnostic specialist in, in Australia and paid an enormous amount of money and he told me that I had chronic fatigue and I should not drink so much coffee. <laughs> so it was a bit exasperating, but that's what happens. You can't avoid it and there's no treatment possible, so you become an electrosmog victim. You can't go to work and you feel sick all the time, so on and so on. The mechanisms of electrosensitivity are not known. So after you've heard this lecture, you will understand a little bit about what it, what it may be. E-smog and HBF share something in common. They're both about fields, and all fields interreact. Once this interreaction occurs, it happens because of matching. One part of the field matches a part of the field in your body. So we begin to ask which part of the body field does e-smog match with? It's a brilliant idea. So we're moving you on a little bit from where you were to where we want you to be, which is e-smog experts, I guess. Now what if a whole lot of protein material in the body had added to it some metallic stuff? Don't you think the metal would increase the sensitivity of that tissue to e-smog. Knowing what metals do, knowing what their atomic qualities are, and so forth. That's sort of science we won't go into. So we looked at cadmium, which we know has an affinity with stomach and bowel. Just look up your homeopathic books. Lead, look up your homeopathic books. Nervous system and brain. Mercury, also in homeopathic books. See, homeopaths are great toxicologists. If you want to know anything about energic toxicology, get your homeopathic Materia Medica. Sit it on your desk. You will be looking at it six times a day. Mercury has an affinity with the kidney and brain tissue. Tin has an affinity with the hormones and enzyme systems of the body. Now I'm saying, what if these tissues that have these heavy metals in, and other metals, what if they become over-energised? Does the risk of cancer not go higher? In every case of breast cancer I've ever looked at, clinically, there has been 
coming up on the nest screen, heavy metals, lead in the breast tissue. 100%. I have never found somebody with breast cancer who didn't have heavy metal problems. And as you've been told by Jason too, completely correctly, that if you see heavy metals, whether it's chelation is needed or what, number one, get rid of the heavy metals. Forget the protocol, forget everything. Just get rid of heavy metals because I think they make the e-smog effect worse. Increases the risk of cancer simply by attracting more energy to that tissue. So we've said in science we think it's a good idea to follow systems right to their very bitter end. And remember that we developed this idea of 12 integrators, which we've shown you the pie graph many times today and yesterday. And then it suddenly dawned on me that we haven't got 360 degrees, we've got 720, and that Milo Wolf says he thinks that the electron might diverge into two cores and oscillate, making two, two lots of pi, which means we haven't got 12 integrators, which you've just hit you with that. It dawned upon Peter about Christmas time that maybe there were two sets of 12 and we have 24 integrators. So we followed the system to its end. And that always brings you some good information. So we discovered another 12 integrators, which were actually predicted, I think, by the milo wolf theory of the electron. Beautiful stuff. I'm hoping to meet milo wolf sometime so we can say, guess what happened when we followed your theory? We discovered a lot of interesting stuff. Can we have a slide? here. We found that there weren't 12 energetic compartments that they split. At higher energy levels they split. It's not always 24, sometimes it's 12. The higher energy levels I've always associated with uh, cancer, psychosis, schizophrenia, hyperactivity, all of these things people get that there's absolutely not much you can do for them clinically. So we get this amazing splitting happening in, in two bits. Okay, we have another slide. The atom is actually known to have not so much shells as standing waves going out more or less indefinitely, according to Milo Wolf. A standing wave in a sphere, that should read. We haven't had time to correct some of these. Electrons are waves in three dimensions. In the centre, we have where the most charge of the electron is, being negative. We have a wave going in, what appears to be a wave going in, going out. In other words, the electron can actually know, in inverted commas, what is out there and things out there can know what is in that electron. Okay, we have another one. We have a normal energy of the electron. We have an excited energy where these two charge places in space, where there's slightly more charge than elsewhere, they begin to move apart and we think that it's a quantum jump. This is the only part of the human body field where we actually get real quantum stuff happening. We think it jumps to a higher level. Uh, this stage here, E, e naught, normal energy function, this is what happens when you're healthy. You expose yourself to an incredible amount of energy from outside, and I'm saying any sort of energy, light, heat, radiation, everything. This is, when it gets going, it jumps. At that stage, it's possible for you to develop primary cancer. Then there's a second quantum jump occurs where they split further apart by another little distance. That's the second stage. That is equivalent to cancer two or secondary cancer. Okay, we've tested this. We find people with primary cancer 
will match that, the people with secondary cancer match that and so on. So we have very little information on cancer, but what little bit we can tell you, not claiming to be able to cure it, we say this is interesting information and that's all. Now the fascinating thing is that we've got to get people who have got, oh, not just cancer, it can be arthritis here, this sort of quantum job, don't necessarily get cancer, you might get very bad arthritis. Homeopaths have always thought of cancer and arthritis, some sort of deviant energy state, and they're quite right. All right, so we've got the possibility here of schizophrenia and psychosis and all sorts of disturbed mental states that show a heightened awareness. You know, schizophrenics know everything. They're incredibly bright. They have huge insights. It's just that a whole lot of other stuff is completely haywire. I once heard this great radio program about the wisdom of schizophrenics. They're amazing. Okay, why am I saying this? It's because we have another slide. No, I don't want that one. Doesn't matter. No, can we go back twice? That's it, just leave it there. We found that once we got to integrator 12 and we start getting into the next lot of them, I tried to find out, did it match to any human organs, it, these new compartments like 13, 14, 15, 16, etc. And after a while they wouldn't match to anything. But they would match 13, 14, 15, that's just a little bit higher than normal. They match to cerebellum, cerebral vesicles, organ of corti, synapses of the nervous system, the nerve cell itself, and the crown chakra, that strange thing on the top of your head that you read about in your yoga and kundalini book. That was all we could find. And the interesting thing was the cerebral vesicles are cavities in the brain with a pressurised fluid system in them which increases their sensitivity and storage ability. And is this some sort of human radar device where, you know, we're talking about your dog knows when you're coming back and so on, the cat knows when it's going to the vet and so on. We get premonitions of doom, but very rarely premonitions of joy, but it can happen. We're thinking, is there a mechanism possible in the brain for this super sensitive behaviour? Well, maybe it's there. Maybe we were sort of on the verge of finding out about a sort of a human radar. And then I thought, oh yes, Harry and I can take some of this and we'll become psychic and we'll get little antennas coming out of our head. We'll go, bzz, bzz. We know how to make Ness work better. Well, I didn't do it because we're over-energising the system and I thought it's not worth the risk of um, over-energising because of the nasty nature of the diseases you get when the whole body field jumps to a higher energy level. Okay, so I'm naturally cautious because I've seen a lot of medicine in my time and lots of strange things and after a while you learn to be a bit conservative about medicine. However, once we went above 15, you know, 16, 17, up to 24, all it would match with was um, electromagnetic radiation, microwave ovens, visible light, ultraviolet light and x-rays. In other words, the organs don't respond, but the body field is responding to those incredible high energy wavelengths. Okay, interesting stuff, interesting stuff. We don't know entirely what it means yet. But the point is, we're not going to issue you with a whole lot of another set of 12, of 13 to 24 integrators. Instead, we found out something even more interesting. We have the next slide. This is what happens in our, in our human field. We get axes within it. You know an axis is what really holds things together and remember there's something interesting about axes as far as electromagnetic and other types of fields are concerned. The electric field is at 90 degrees to the magnetic, all this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. 
Remember all that for physics? No, you don't. Never mind. <laughs> 90 degrees is really important. And if the whole field is just about to collapse or has collapsed, I suddenly thought of an amazing emergency treatment of treating the axis, 3, 6, 9, 1, 12. Because maybe the whole body field suddenly just gets grossly distorted and you get very, very ill because information transfer stops. And guess what? In cancer, that's exactly what happens. You don't die of the cancer. You die of the cessation of, of uh, your activities in the body. Liver collapses, kidneys collapse, heart sometimes just stops. The whole system fails. In other words, cancer is a failure of the body field, complete failure. That's the way we're thinking about it at the moment. And we're looking at compression and distortion of different compartments in the body that go with this distortion of the entire body field. And if you ask me what I think the integrators are doing, they're correcting those distortions of the whole body field. Some compartments end up having too much space and some of them get compressed. No, perhaps have another slide. They're looking a bit like they want another one. Years and years ago, I did experiments with hydrogen. The bond of hydrogen, I don't know how I worked out how to represent a hydrogen bond, I just don't know anymore. But we found this reference point, 4, 7 and 11. In health, people had a hydrogen bond that corresponded to four units of something. We didn't know what. In other words, we had a number four. And this could be just the ratio of how long the bond length is. Then it would jump to seven of the units. Four is to seven. And a third one, it would go to 11 units. Four is to seven is to 11. That's just a ratio. Obviously, it, it's very tiny. But when the hydrogen bonds don't work properly, the DNA isn't going to be able to work properly either because the DNA unzips in the middle <coughs> along the weak hydrogen bonds between the two, sp the two spirals. Remember that? Yes, of course you do. Right, so we're getting a link back to physiology about how the energy level of the body field could affect physiology via the hydrogen bonds. Interesting stuff. Next one, give us another. Remember I was saying, what do I think this e-smog, which is all sorts of different frequencies joined up together as a sort of a pumpkin soup or something. Which organ? It's the heart. Remember yesterday I was actually lecturing you and I'd put the, the transmitter for my microphone in here. No, that was wrong. Now I've got it down there today. The reason is that um, e-smog affects the heart. Acute e-smog signs are palpitations, cardiac arrhythmias, pain in the chest, changes in blood pressure either up or down, fast or slow heart rate, tachycardia, etc. blah, blah, shortness of breath, which will be because your heart's under stress. It looks as if the heart is a candidate for a prime candidate for effect from all radiation, which is why you have to keep these little transmitters and radios and mobile phones away from your heart. That's just a health tip number 967. Then we discovered that we could make up a star, something to treat. We suddenly thought, well, maybe we could treat e-smog because it looked as if Harry and I, Harry spends all day on the phone on the, on the, on the brain fryer, and I spend all day walking around town here getting lots of e-smog from Radio Denio and, uh, and all the rest of it. ES1, we discovered, this is the new formula that's just been released, matches to the heart. Now, which parts of the heart? I thought, this is amazing. We've got the symptoms matching with the heart, and then we find a medicine that matches with the heart. 
fantastic. Myocardium, all valves of the heart, auricles and ventricles, the septum, sinoatrial node, and atrioventricular node. E-smog affects the heart first, and then you get all the other symptoms, like the thyroid, the brain, you know, e-smog affects any part of your body, because it's affecting the way in which the heart imprints messages for the rest of the body via the blood. There's a lot of messages go through the proteins in the blood, right? That's one huge part of your body field is the cardiovascular system. Let's have another slide. This is somebody who is now dead. <laughs> I just, it's a gruesome picture, but this is what happens when you get spontaneous human combustion. I'm saying we're not in fantasy land here. We've got, if you go to the site on the web, spontaneous human combustion, you can read up all these alleged fairy stories. It doesn't fit anyone's um, model of the universe about how people can suddenly just burn up. But this, this person had a, had a very bad day. <laughs> it's awful. It's horrifying. And, and people don't know where to put this. How can people just suddenly burn? Um, it doesn't fit the medical model at all. It fits our model where we say the human body field suddenly jumped a couple of things up. And instead of developing cancer, the energy was used. If you develop cancer, the whole of the body goes haywire. Your ability to copy proteins goes haywire. You're, 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 you aren't able to detox properly and so on. Everything goes wrong all at once. You feel really lousy. So I thought I'd just throw in that horrific picture to show this is possible within the Ness model of the human body field. That, and then you say, hey, wait a minute. I remember saying to a scientist in uh, Australia, well, why don't we burn up? If we're all making energy all the time, allegedly from carbohydrates and sugars, um, why don't we just get hotter and hotter? Where's the thermostat that says, oh, we'll release a bit of heat. Oh, we won't produce so much heat. Aha. Uh -huh. Nobody knows. No physiologist knows how heat is controlled in the body. And yet, if you get a deviation in your core temperature of one degree centigrade or more, you just die from exposure. How does the body regulate its temperature? A contrary to the second law of thermodynamics, th second law of thermodynamics, which says we should be the same temperature as the surrounding air or water. So we went looking for it. And this was all following a hunch. And my hunch is uh, sometimes right. If you look at this little diagram here. And if this little valve goes wrong, if 12 won't go feed back into one, but begins to feed into another loop, this is a sign you're going to develop an over-energized field, get cancer, psychosis, or start talking to the trees or something, if you don't want. Okay, here is the formula. This one's worth a million dollars. The formula to make sure that 12 feeds back into one and you don't get um, a high energy human body field is heart driver at the same treatment time as EI12 and then EI1, about five to ten minutes apart. You have your heart driver, wait ten minutes. EI-12, wait ten minutes. EI-1, wait ten minutes. That's called taking them all at the same treatment session. Don't mix them. I mix them, but I, I'm brave. I think I can handle it, but I think for patients, no. And what happened to me was I had a fever for eight days. I was just hot. <coughs> The energy has got to go somewhere. The physics people are right. You 
you can't destroy energy. If you've got an over-energized body field, when you de-energize it, the heat's going to come out as a fever. Now remember the coley toxin man. Remember I on the first day I talked to you about this guy called Coley, who injected erysipelas toxins every two or three days into the muscles with people with cancer. After a while, they got a fever of 40 to 42 degrees centigrade, and the cancer went away. In other words, there is some historical interest here because you say, what if the erysipelas toxins had nothing to do with it? And the important thing about what he was doing was inducing a fever. There are a million homeopaths from the last 200 years will say that an amazing cure has happened to somebody after inducing a fever. And the fever is the body's way of reducing its energy level. And a million homeopaths will tell you that inflammatory responses and heat are actually a healing sign and not something to, to be worried about excessively. Next one, that was a bit... We want a happy one this time. So there we are. The heart driver links EI12 back to E1. If you can see, that it's simply the energy has to keep within the same standing wave. And there must be mathematics to describe each compartment. Okay, sorry, I can't interrupt my flow of thought. There must be mathematics there. We haven't got it. If we get a physicist and mathematician one day, we'll see what we can do. The energy level one is supported. You're affecting the whole body field at once. So this is one of those big treatments you do once you've done everything else and you want to do something carefully and slowly. So keep the doses way down to like six drops and wait very carefully. See if there's an onset of... Oh, I had a low grade fever for eight days. And um, I've got the remains of a big skin cancer on my nose, which I hope is gone. You see what I mean? We, we can't say we can treat cancer, but we say, well, I can take this stuff and see what happens to my growths. Everybody's got one somewhere, you know. Everybody's got warts or, or something or other. Let's see what happens. That's all you can do. Is that the right order? Oh, no, I'm just saying that 12 eventually has to go back into 1 and that to make sure that happens, this is what you do. But may I tell you this one thing? Please, that is the correct order of taking them. It must be adhered to. Remember, the body is ordinal. It likes things in a certain order. If you mix up the order, you'll do something else. It's that important. So make sure you put one, two, and three. No. Oh, you can't see it. Mm. Oh, you know, can you see that? Anyway. Yeah, all right. It's back to front, it's all right. Okay, we go on to maybe another diagram. Have we got another one? That's the end of slideshow. You can all go home. It seems to me that the order in which you treat, and the, particularly the integrators, in which you give. We always tell you to give the integrators in the right order because that's the order that's dictated by the standing wave. We want to keep harmony in the wave as much as possible, so the order of administration becomes quite critical. 
also, the, you now know a couple of interesting things you can do, and one of them is to give energetic integrators one, uh, uh, no, three, six, and nine, again, 10 minutes apart at the same treatment time. If you've got a human field that's been squashed flat or is just madly distorted, you're not going to do this just on your, of your own bat. You're going to look on your nest screen and see, have we got a three, have we got a six, or have we got a six and a nine? I think if you've got two out of the three, there's a good reason for using that as a treatment, to try to straighten up the whole body field at once. Well, some people say, I'm not getting results. What am I doing wrong? Something I don't know. As soon as we find out something that's going to be of help, will we try to tell you? Okay, now, we've got to talk about... ES1. I haven't got a slide for ES1. ES1 is a new formula that's just come out as of this conference. The old ES1 was good, it was for immunity. And we've scrapped it and we've put in another one because ES1 we're producing now <coughs> is for all types of electrosmog as well as for immunity. Somehow or other the electrosmog suppresses the activity of the immune system. If I were wrecked on a desert island and I was allowed one infraceutical, this is the one that I would like. Believe it or not, this one matches to the immune system, all the lymphatic organs, and the heart, all parts of the heart, and e-smog. In other words, it's, uh, it does an awful lot of things at once. When I say the lymphatic organs, I mean the thymus, the spleen, the omentum, that's a bit of tissue in your abdominal cavity, the bone marrows, the villi of the small intestine, the tonsillar ring and the veriform appendix. They're all organs which have an effect on the lymph system direct. You're going to hit them all at once. Fantastic stuff. We did some testing and found that ES1, new formula, will affect the macrophages, the monocytes, the red marrow cells, for instance, erythrocytes and reticulocytes, and the yellow marrow cells, which means myelocytes and metamyelocytes, etc. Because we're having effect on the bone marrow, you remember it takes some time for these uh, parts of the immune system to mature between five and maybe 30 days, maybe 60 days. So ES1 will have a delayed effect as well as an instant effect on e-smog in the heart. It will have a delayed effect on improving your immunity. Your client needs to be told that there is a long-term effect of ES1, and I suggest it should always be taken for about 30 days. ES1 is for the damage caused to the cell-mediated immune system by e-smog. The thymus organ matches with ES1. Thymus goes wrong in cancer as well, interesting does this via the T cells, which, and it can affect the maturation of the cells that the body uses for attacking bacteria, parasites, fungi, and even cancer cells. Now we developed another driver that you can get. It's on your new software, this one. Have you seen uh, the spleen momentum driver? It's right at the end of the list of drivers. So when you use the new software, you'll find this spleen omentum driver. So I'm going to tell you, there's a help file with it, of course, on the software. I'll tell you a little bit about it now.
It is tagged with the, the spleen pulp, the red pulp, the white pulp of the spleen, as well as the omentum, which is a large mesenteric sheet in the lining of the abdomen, which has a strong immune function. It also matches with the thymus, with every part of the thymus. So we've called it spleen omentum because we think the omentum is as important as the spleen in, um, in immunity. The omentum has an immune function in the abdominal cavity and it becomes active when there's appendicitis or peritonitis. And it's so dynamic that it can actually seal off areas of contamination. Uh, frequently the omentum has been damaged by abdominal surgery. We can't do anything about that, but if you've had abdominal surgery, spleen omentum driver. It has a marked and immediate effect on the chest. This is a little bit hard to explain in Western medicine. But in Chinese medicine, the spleen was always linked to the function of the lungs. How they knew this, I don't know, but it's very commonly known in Chinese medicine. I did some testing to find out the specific organisms that the spleen omentum driver liked to deal with. It has a particular effect on Bordetella pertussis, whooping cough, Haemophilus influenzae, a childhood chest infection, and Neisera catarralis, a respiratory infection, another one. So supposing you've got a chronic chest infection of no known origin, more or less the whole of your life, you treat the spleen immune system and the infection in the chest may disappear as a couple of people here who have already taken it, who've said that's just what happened. So this driver can be used when people say you've got asthma because you've got chronic chest infections that don't clear up. Use it too for swelling in the abdomen. Like in all males over 40, the abdomen begins to take off. This happened to me. And luckily my abdomen's gone down hugely. I've been on spleen omentum driver for six weeks or something. And it uh, goes down, the swelling goes down. It is swelling from inflammation. Not actually from eating too much, although I do have quite a penchant for chocolate cake and postres and tartars and things like that. What about hernia? There's absolutely no treatment in natural medicine for hernia. This driver you should consider as something that is useful for low-level infections in the abdominal cavity that make the muscle wall very weak. Because its effect on the thymus, spleen omentum driver may also be useful in allergies. Allergies occur in the long-term recognition apparatus of the immune systems, which basically long-term immunity seems to be resident in the thymus. The spleen is also known for many years to have been sensitive to electromagnetic radiation as well as ionizing radiation. ES1 is pre preferred for e-smog, but spleen omentum driver has an effect as well. You can use them together if you wish. Now I have to tell you the bad news about this driver. Uh, the good news is it's fantastic. <laughs> the bad news is it makes you grumpy. Uh, <laughs> emotions are information. Emotion, incorrect information like grudges, things you don't like about situations, and spleen, just general feeling of bitch. <laughs> you, You've probably had it, but you didn't want to talk about it. But yeah, this, this one brings out the inner bitch. I'm sorry. The emotion's got to go somewhere and it comes out as... So I think you go away into a little hut on your own by the beach with your can of beans and 
newspaper and just chill out. It takes three or four weeks of taking spleen-omentum driver for this growl factor to begin. But that's an emotion you want on the outside, not on the inside. And all of us over the years build up little grudges and people we'd like to get back at just a little bit, if we could, in a nice way. Um, you can laugh. Long-term usage of, of spleen-omentum driver will bring emotions to the surface and your client needs to know this. In fact, if they get too grouchy and the family wants to send them on a holiday, well, you can use ES1 or you can try to mend the heart. I mean, heart driver and all of this, ES8, ES8 wonderful for solving problems. Spleen-omentum driver appears to be useful for integration between the two hemispheres of the brain, so may be useful in long-term treatments for learning and emotional difficulties. Um, if you want to actually stop the spleen from making your life miserable and, and it grumbles and groans, you can switch off, you use the kidney driver to switch off the spleen when you've had enough of the grumbles. The dosage for spleen omentum driver is six drops, and again, you can increase that slowly. Mm -mm. Six, nine, 15, 28, so on, depending on how much you think you can take. I was taking 15 drops three times a day, it's 45 drops a day. We have to take enormous doses to work out what it does, so it becomes very obvious what that one is doing. And we don't suggest to you that you do this with clients, where they'll come back and say, what do you think you're doing to me? So uh, yeah, you have to remember to be as conservative as pos. Now I think we've probably got to our time. And there were, I think the lady up there had a question. Oh, for that, for that recipe. Oh, not much. It takes about a week for it to start happening, and then you get, oh, I feel so hot. And don't take aspros, don't take disparin, don't suppress it, just a cool bars or you know, mop your brow or something. Let the heat out, because it might save your life. So we're suggesting this isn't a beginner's treatment. If you've been using Nest for a while and you've done our courses and you know something about it, I suggest that with the really difficult cases, that could be what to do to get uh, a good clinical result. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure you've had enough of me today. What's this last one? Peter, you said this can, the spleen omentum driver can make you driver. Can yeah. make you any worse than the liver driver? Because yeah. I described the liver driver as a shitty liver. And you've got the grumps. And that's generally what I get. You know, people come back and say, I've got really, really shitty. No, with the liver driver you get angry. With the spleen drive, you get sort of uh, low rumblings of a, of a volcano about to explode. It's, a, it's suppressed, it's very suppressed anger. And that's the emotion that goes with cancer. If you want to read about that, read Wilhelm Reich's book about the cancer biopathy, about the emotional state of people before they get cancer and they've got a grudge about it. They don't want to tell you, but there's a grudge there. And if the emotion has got to come to the surface somehow. And if you can help that person through getting that emotion out and telling the person concerned what they did, uh, you know, healing, if you're able to help with emotional healing, well, this is definitely for you. It's quite common to have these overcharged energy fields generally. Okay, thanks very much for listening.